Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Courtney Gardner, Partner Marketing Coordinator here at Proficient, and I'm excited to be moderating today's webinar, Projecting Supply Chain Performance with Encorda Analytics. Time permitting, we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the event, so please type your questions into the Q&A tab located to the right of your screen and feel free to do that at any time. Two questions often come up with our online events. Can I get a copy of the slides and a link to the recording? The answer to both questions is yes. We will email you with information on how to access both the slides and the recording following today's event. I'd now like to introduce you to today's speakers. Matthew Halliday is a veteran software engineer and data analytics expert. He co-founded Encorda in 2013 after more than 15 years at Oracle and several years managing products at Microsoft. Mazen Manasa is the Business Analytics Director here at Proficient with 18 years of experience working with analytics, data warehouses, and BI solutions. And he has done multiple full lifecycle BI implementations across various industries. So now I'd like to hand it over to Mazen to take us through today's agenda. Thanks, Courtney. Um, so for the, the agenda for this webinar is gonna be, we're gonna do brief introductions about uh, who Proficient is as a company. Um, then we'll dive into the common business objectives that businesses try to achieve from a supply chain um, BI solution to balance supply and demand. But what are the common challenges we hear our customers have to deal with to accomplish this solution? And what, what requirements we have put together as a company trying to solve those problems? We'll go through those as a guideline to, to finding the right solution. And then Matthew will introduce Encoda to us and talk about how it will kind of fit within those guidelines for the supply chain dashboard solution. Um, I'll then take you through the high level KPIs that you'll see on the dashboard uh, in terms of um, projecting uh, inventory balances, projecting demand fill rates, and you'll see a, a live demo of the dashboard and how to drill down to all the details from a supply and demand perspective within the same dashboard. We will wrap up with key takeaways to remind you of uh, what, what this webinar is about and then wrap it up with questions. All right, so proficient at a glance, we are a digital transformation company publicly traded on the NASDAQ and we were founded in 97 uh, with close to 1 billion of annual revenue. And we have major presence in um, major cities across the United States, but also globally available in development centers, both nearshore and offshore. We do have over 6,000 colleagues so far and growing. And a fundamental thing about our business is our uh, repeat business rate. So 90% is our repeat business rate, which means that we tend to kind of partner with our customers, not just to uh, make them live on new solutions, but also ensure their success and make sure they're on a successful journey way beyond their go live. We do have dedicated solution practices and partnerships with major uh, technology vendors. And so about our business analytics practice, we are closely associated with the Oracle um, implementation teams, and these would be the ERP, so whether eBusiness Suite or Fusion, um, Oracle applications, ERP supply chain, HCM, as well as Oracle EPM applications. Um, so our BI consultants are very much um, aware of the data models um, and the operations that go on within these applications. And so we, we kind of help our customers with their strategies, both short-term and long-term um, transformational strategies, and we do implementations on-premise cloud as well as hybrid solutions. Uh, we do also, also offer uh, post-go-live or post-implementation managed services to our customers. So extensive experience over 20 years in this domain, um, over 3,000 deployments so far. And we do serve several industries, including manufacturing, uh, energy, oil and gas, as well as consumer markets. And so if we start talking about uh, the objectives of, of uh, the supply chain dashboard you're gonna see today, it's primarily to improve the supply chain reliability by being more proactive in managing inventory. And so if you are aware of the supply chain score model, we're talking about the sales reliability here, which is gonna be tracked through the projected fill rate, the demand fill rate, and how we relate that to the uh, days of supply. And so traditional reporting 
may be more focused on what happened in the past. It's more historical in nature. It tells us what happened or why something happened in the past. But, but that information comes in too late when we want to be able to solve a problem or avoid having a problem happen in the future. So it's important to optimize our forward coverage. Um, and that's not, not an easy task we've seen. It may require a lot of manual processes today to, com to combine data from sales, um, whether it's booking data or forecasting data from sales, together with data from your warehouse for inventory, uh, from purchasing, as well as maybe if you're in manufacturing from a scheduled uh, work orders. So a lot of different data sets to, to deal with to get this solution together. And so it's important to, to kind of promote this proactive culture of recognizing, reacting to foreseeable problems in the supply chain, uh, recognize uh, demand that is at risk, and reduce the risk of running out of stock. We want to be able to easily pinpoint uh, whenever our projected balances are um, going low and understand what is the root cause uh, of the shortage. Is it, for example, a sourcing issue? Uh, do we need to address purchasing schedules or the volumes of those purchases, or is it more of a production issue? Um, are the scheduled jobs sufficient to keep up with the projected demand? Um, is the production shortage uh, an issue with the raw materials, or is it a resource issue with labor or equipment? Um, so even suppliers may come into play as well to, to handle supplier capacity. So different factors come into play to, to come up with uh, a good future outlook. And when we think about this objective, it kind of touches along different areas of the supply chain, uh, the warehouse, the demand side, sourcing, as well as production. Uh, from a warehouse, warehouse perspective, it's important to, go, to kind of enable growth and optimization uh, by freeing up time doing those routine tasks and focus more on growth and optimization. Um, from a demand perspective, uh, it's important to understand the the impact that we, we may have due to our operations on the customers and the anticipated demand. Where is the most impact? Uh, how much is the dollar value of that impact to our customers? Um, also want to be able to be ready to handle the anticipated demand, not just from a booking perspective, but from a forecasted sales perspective. So you're gonna see a variation in the demo of handling um, actuals, which, which are actual sales, but also bring a different scenario based on forecast as well. Right. And from the sourcing perspective, we're looking at suppliers who want to be able to identify the underperforming suppliers and we want to be able to quantify that, for example, based on the late uh, purchase orders and track which suppliers are uh, underperforming. Uh, and this will help us kind of facilitate make or buy decisions if you're in manufacturing, uh, you're going to see what are the um, events that are mostly impacting the, uh, the supply chain performance with, with negative inventory balance projections. And in production, from a production perspective, it's important to um, address any processes that have adverse impact. Uh, as I said, whether it's raw material issues or uh, labor issues, identify those bottlenecks and see what, what work orders need to be addressed. So really the objective will help us treat benefits uh, across different fronts uh, from a supply chain uh, perspective. And so a lot of the teams that work on a solution like this would, would have to face challenges. And we're highlighting some of these here. First of all, it's understanding the future outlook of the supply chain. Um, we would typically hear that the reporting capabilities will give a description of what happened in the past but uh, the teams are unaware of, uh, for example, what is the projected demand fill rate? Uh, what is their expected days of supply? They're kind of unaware of that because they're focused on their, their backward view. And then the scalability on performance of reporting. Um, they may have a solution today, but it's unscalable. It doesn't um, handle millions and billions of rows. You know, if you're dealing with hundreds of suppliers, millions of dollars in inventory, you may have different plants, manufacturing plants, different warehouses or distribution centers. Um, it's not, um, the, the solution has to be scalable to handle you know, all that data load. And then from a efficiency perspective of current BI processes, there may be 
a lot of routine tasks, sometimes manual tasks, and these are error prone. Um, a lot of the teams would use multiple reports that rely on each other. So you have lookups from one report to the other to identify correlation between um, inventory transactions, POs, sales orders, uh, pulling in item master data, maybe planning data for forecasts. So really different data sets. And uh, if it's not streamlined and automated, uh, it would be kind of inefficient to, to maintain. Um, information overload, sometimes the, there's a lot of information, a lot of reports, but the important piece of, of information is kind of buried uh, in that massive amount of data. Uh, that's why it's important to have a capability to do exception type reporting, um, uh, to kind of bubble up the urgent priorities. Um, it's also important to have that um, horizontal forward looking view of, of um, transactions. So you see uh, not kind of in a uh, massive spreadsheet with a lot of records, but also, but but in a pivot table on a horizontal timeline, what is the projected performance for an item for an organization? Um, so we we kind of uh, try to promote doing alerts here to kind of alert people of things that they need to focus their attention on instead of looking through spreadsheets and massive data. Reporting reliability, that's also a challenge. Uh, if you have multiple disconnected reports, um, maybe you have redundant logic that is repeated in different reports, and uh, uh, that way you kind of have to maintain different uh, reports for the same calculations. Another thing is the lack of supporting details. So if you have a summary dashboard, which is great to look at at a high level, but it doesn't provide all the details that you would need to kind of take action or corrective action. Um, data may be stale, uh, it's unreliable, it's not up to date to take action on, uh, so require more frequent data updates. So that's kind of a very common challenge we deal with. And then finally here, time to insight. Time to insight. Uh, some of the teams may have a solution uh, today, but it's not easy to evolve and enhance over time with new requirements, especially when it requires pulling in more data uh, update the data pipeline uh, without really breaking existing functionality or impacting the performance of the existing dashboards. So it's important when we think about solution for this whole process is to make it scalable, uh, but also um, allow, allow it to evolve and enhance over time uh, to, to provide time to insight. So these are kind of um, the main challenges we, we deal with in doing a solution like this. And so when we, sat down to put a solution together, we had in mind to come up with an innovative and scalable approach, unlike the traditional data warehouse approach. Um, and so we put together those guidelines to help us do a reliable solution. And that those requirements are kind of broken into three main areas. There's the data integration area, the data storage, and then the data retrieval and usage. Um, from the data integration perspective, um, it's important to kind of map to the different data sources as is, as opposed to doing transformation of the data. Uh, and in this case, uh, our solution is based off of eBusiness Suite. So, and if you're familiar with eBusiness Suite, it has uh, so many different schemas, different data uh, models with hundreds of tables, uh, thousands of joins. And so we wanted to maintain all that complexity within the foundation data model, as opposed to uh, creating a new data model as is typical in a data warehouse, which is more of a star schema model. So we're going away from the ETL approach where we're doing a lot of transformation to an ELT approach, which is uh, direct mapping to the source. Uh, and this, the benefit of this really is to allow us to do the, that near real time uh, refresh of the data. So there's much less um, uh, overload whenever we wanna update the data or even enhance it over time by bringing in more columns or more uh, data sets. And then from a data storage perspective, uh, we want a solution that's able to handle the third normal form data models. Uh, and if you're, if, you're, if you're familiar with that, it's basically whatever the transactional systems do from a data model perspective, we would like to maintain that in our dashboard solution. Um, because all that complexity of the source transactional systems and supply chain would have different data data models handling different areas, whether it's the inventory, um, order management, 
purchasing and so forth. Uh, so wanted to maintain all that in its native form, but also be able to leverage all the different relationships between those tables. Um, so that's why it's important to, to kind of have a storage layer in a third normal form, uh, but also be able to scale that and optimize it for uh, for handling you know millions and billions of rows, not just uh, low volumes of data. So performance is kind of at the root of the solution here. And um, we want to make sure that the solution can handle projections. So we're not just looking at um, the data as it is today or the current state of things, but also be able to, to generate projections and look forward on a horizontal timeline. So both on the demand and the supply perspective, we want to be able to project and generate those projections. And from the data retrieval and usage perspective, um, it, the requirement really is to automate all that mapping, correlation, aggregation among the different data sets, uh, merging, for example, inventory by item to the open sales orders, to the purchasing uh, side of things, manufacturing and forecasting. So all those different data sets need to be um, queried and retrieved um, in, a, in a kind of fast response time. And we need to be able to look at the KPIs not just at high level, but also navigate down to the underlying details behind those KPIs. For example, which customers are impacted by a projected never in negative inventory? Uh, so I want to see which customers have the, are going to be at risk. Uh, or by what date, for example, do we expect the, the balance to be at risk? And when will the inventory be replenished? So all those are specific details that we won't have unless we have the underlying details as part of the solution itself. Another key requirement is to automate the calculation of complex metrics. For example, projected days on hand, projected fill rates, uh, all those will have to be uh, streamlined and automated. Um, standardization of the KPIs is also important for all departments across the supply chain to provide them with summaries, trends, and drill down to details. Uh, and we want to be able to enable the business to focus on priorities through alerts and exception reporting. For example, we want to be able to uh, alert the buyers of inventory shortages. I want to alert them of the customers that are at risk of not having their shipments on time, or maybe the manufacturing processes that need to be addressed. And if there's going to be big sales orders coming in, we want to be able to uh, point that to their attention so they can um, provide the purchase orders or the work orders that need to accommodate the demand. So th those are kind of the key guidelines that we had in mind when we thought about putting a solution together for this um, for this task. And here's here's where I'm going to hand it over to Matthew, who's going to elaborate more on how Encorda is going to be um, well positioned to handle those type of uh, challenges. Matthew, Great. thank you, Mazen. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what is the Encorda platform. And what makes it absolutely unique for this type of data problem? And so there's a couple of things that when we think about what is this kind of data problem? Well, people like to think of data as being kind of generic, like the same kind of data that comes off my thermostat is the same type of data that comes out of my ERP system. But are they really the same? I would contend that they're not, and they're very different. And one of the reasons that I know this is from experience. Um, of course, we've heard tons of amazing stories from companies that have done amazing things with data platforms at the core of how they deliver their services. Think like streaming services, think about social media platforms. And they're able to process like 300 petabytes of data in these data platforms, yet something like 56 gigs of ERP data thrown onto one of those platforms, that should be child's play. But in essence, they're not, and they run into problems and challenges because the data footprint and the challenges of the data that we experience in these business applications like supply chain, like ERP, are fundamentally different. And here's just some of the things that make these challenges um, unique to the ERP, the third normalization form that Mazen spoke about, or the way just applications store data in relational databases. Um, it's very difficult to have agility in these because um, as any one of us um, 
you know, remember those days when you used to call up people to get like, you know, updates on your orders, right? We'd get on the phone, you'd, you'd say, they'd say, what's your order number? You'd give them your order number and then they would say, oh, I'm sorry, give me a few minutes. My system's slow today. And they're just pulling up one record, one order. Well, if you want to do that kind of analysis across lots, it becomes incredibly slow and difficult. And the reason why it was so onerous is because it had so many objects behind. So a single order on a screen that you might look at in an application might have 40 tables actually having the data that you are looking at. So it resides in 40 tables that are stitched together on the fly to give you that one record that you're looking at. It's fine for transactions, it's not great for analytics. It's hard to model this data. So when you have it, it's like, how do I get it into a form that I can use? Um, the performance is very slow, the structures, it's the most crushing thing you can ask a database to do. And so really, People didn't do analytics on their ERP system, right? We don't, you would bring it to its knees and then you couldn't actually do any operations on it. So that wouldn't work. So you have to have this additional approach. Everyone's like, okay, well, what are these new technologies out there? How can we do it? And so people would say, okay, let's let's take a look at that. Let's, let's look at what's the modern tech stack and the modern approach. And now just to be very clear, this is not the approach that I'm recommending. This is the approach a lot of people would actually say, this is the way to do it. I contend there's a better way. Now. The problem with this approach here is it's you're really in the middle there. It's what happens to your data. So you have these source applications and you, you bring the data over and then you have to transform the data and then you have to aggregate it because you cannot run those queries directly against the data in the shape that it's in. I wish you could, but you couldn't, you can't. And so you end up flattening the data and making business decisions on how do you want that data to look? And that's probably the most important thing to get from here is that the data gets fragmented and it gets rolled up and aggregated and everything is based upon the questions that you want to know up front so it doesn't lend itself for flexibility if your questions change you're probably out of luck you'll probably have to go back and rebuild a whole ton of this stuff and we'll get into that a little bit more but your data in essence ends up being fragmented and it's not a direct correlation between what you see in the analytics and what you see in the application. And that's the key thing we wanna say. It's like, I wanna be able to do analytics, look at numbers and drill down all the way to the point that I can see the transaction and tie it back and go look at that exact transaction and be able to find it because it's exactly the same. It hasn't been transformed or changed. I'm just experiencing the same data in a different way. These platforms don't provide that approach. So the Encorda way is we stepped into that and said, hey, we're not gonna try and fix the social media problem or your thermostat data problem. We wanna fix your business application problem. That's my background. I came from Oracle eBusiness Suite and Cloud ERP and worked on those platforms for many, many years. Very familiar with lots and lots of tables and lots of transactions and volume. And now when we looked at that, we said, how can we make it so that you can actually analyze on the same data that's coming from the source system. So more think replication of data and running against it in the same way that I could build a report on my source system, but I probably wouldn't be allowed to run it against every bit of my data. Probably someone would say, scream at me and kill the job. They would say, you need to give it parameters. You need to put it down to maybe just open orders in the last 30 days, right? There'd be all of these like very strict parameters that were put on me. But the Encore platform, we said, okay, well, what if we could take that out so we don't put any load on the source system and then we can analyze everything, but we won't change the data. We won't make it so that you're looking at a aggregation, summarization, losing that transactional detail, you get everything. And how can I experience that as well in the way that I want to experience it? Um, although in this demo that Mazin's gonna show later, he'll show in Coda as the visualization, you can use whatever tool you want. If you want to use Excel, go ahead. If you want to use Power BI, be my guest. If you want to use Tableau, go for it. Those are the ways you want to consume. So. When you see that, don't get caught up in thinking, oh, it's a visualization tool. No, there is a visualization component, but it's very different in the sense that it's the ability to provide the data behind the scenes. So think, finding that needle in a haystack, being able to drill down into every bit of transactional detail and summarize it and see things being recalculated on the fly. That's the key. And that's where this gets very, very interesting. So how do we do this? So I'm going to show a pretty um, detailed architecture slide here, but really what I want you to take away from this is that 
there are a lot of capabilities in here that your IT teams will salivate over. They will love this. If you told them, say, hey, we're looking at this solution and it handles um, storage with you know, Parquet and Delta Lake formats, and uh, they got access to Spark and Zeppelin notebooks and R and PySpark and all these great things that are available. And I can bring in these different queries and run against it. And it has got data lineage and um, data ingest and all these kind of capabilities. These are the things that are important to them. These are the things that enable them to come in and actually say, oh, wow, that's, that's a great platform. It's got some things in here that actually we can, that we can leverage and use. We can do data science. We can extend beyond it. So there's many areas, capabilities, and components to this, but it's built around open standards. It's built around this belief that your data shouldn't be locked in to one vendor, that you should have options and you should be able to use it for when it makes the most sense. But you shouldn't be locked in and say, well, we post this platform, now we have no other option, we can only use that solution. No, we wanted to make something that really, you would use it because it was the best solution for you to use. So the main, the main thing, the main driving thing that makes Encoda really, really shine is what we refer to as direct data mapping. And so well, what is that? Well, in reality, the data resides in thousands of tables with thousands of joins between those tables. Now, when Encoder looks and copies those tables out of that source database, which would never perform, which could never run the query um, in the time that would be of use to anyone, that when we bring it in, we do some analysis. We actually look at the relationships. And so we understand exactly how that data relates one to each other from different tables across the entire schema. So across the entire data set, if you like. We do that very quickly with our loading process. And then once we have that, we leverage the query engine we have alongside this metadata layer that we've built, this map that enables us to run queries at incredible speed, so fast that you do not need to do the traditional transformation that you would have to do to put it into a new shape. Most solutions are suggesting your analytical data shape is different than your source system. We say it doesn't have to be. It can be the same, and you can run it and get sub-second response on queries that would take hours if you were to run them on the source system, and the only other way around it on these other modern systems is you have to transform the data into, as Mazin mentioned earlier, a star schema, which has a lot of overhead. Um, Encoder makes this uh, a reality so that you can leverage um, the data very, very quickly. Uh, obviously, we use things like in-memory data processing, compressed, but it's also this data map that really makes this thing sing and go so insanely quick. <clears throat> now, there is one thing I'd be the first to admit, the last thing I would want to put in front of anyone, including myself, quite frankly, is a 3NF data model to do analytics. And the reason for that is because there's just so many objects, right? There's so many things, it would be overwhelming. I'd be like, where do I find this value? And where does this belong? So what we have that sits on top is a something called a semantic layer. So we refer to them as business schemas. And these business schemas are business friendly representations of that data. Now, the key thing here is that these are not transformations. They are purely semantic layers, metadata, so very, very low, lightweight. You can change these with just drag and drop. You don't have to repopulate, recalculate. You can just um, engage with these, but it's a way for you to say, this is where you should get the date field. This is where you should get the quantity field. This is where you should get the status field. And this is you know, the description of what it means so I can understand the data. It might be coming from 20, 30, 40 different tables underneath. I don't need to know. I just need to know what's the data set. Maybe it's returns. Maybe it's inventory status. Maybe you know it's um, um, purchasing, and I want to look at you know some some uh, blanket purchase order and things like that. Right? Being able to look at all of the fields pertinent to that area in a way that I don't have to do you know understand. So it's a way that I can make the data look as simple as a CSV spreadsheet. Right? So all the fields. It could be hundreds of fields. It could be 100, 200, 300 thousands of fields, if you want, where they can all be put out in a way that I can just say, oh, I know how to engage with this. I just grab the column I want from this business schema and I'm a way to go. It's great also because when you, as a corporation or an organization, start building on top of these business schemas, you start to build lots of reports, dashboards, other reports that your business becomes dependent on. 
The problem is, what happens if that schema changes? Well, the nice thing with the semantic layer is you just change it in one place and everyone's report retains and continues to work. So you can make sure that people use the right data, that you don't get, well, my report looks different from you. What data set are you using? When was that extracted? No, everyone's using the same, using the same business schema, with the same data, with the same data definitions, and you can understand exactly that. It, it reduces data copies and a whole bunch of stuff that goes on. So these are incredibly powerful. Uh, that coupled with this direct data mapping really makes it easy for you to be agile and to move very, very quickly in terms of how to get data and to build out the data applications that you're gonna see. So one of the things we've provided uh, at Encoder is um, what we refer to as blueprints. And these are blueprints that take a lot of the knowledge and experience that people have in those three and app data models, those application data models, and say, how can we help people get up to speed quickly? To honestly wade through some of this and understand, which you'd have to do with every solution, but we figured we could do something a little bit better here. We could actually create these relationships for you. We could actually make it very smart. So if you say, I need to do some supply chain analysis, that we could say, well, here's the objects we think you're gonna need and here's how they join together. Then you can start to use those business schemas, build out the dashboards exactly as you want them. And of course, there's always gonna be customizations and things that you wanna see specifically to your business, but you have that foundation, which really helps you kind of go. And they're extensible, you can build them, they support things like slowly changing dimensions, uh, which is you know snapshots, being able to say, well, what was my inventory? of an item today, but what was it last Saturday, right? How do I, what was it week before? Being able to have those snapshots uh, are very important. And so they provide a head start, get you up and running, but really they, they're just a great foundation for you to be able to build upon and to build out some really exciting applications. And so when you then get to build and extend, this is where it becomes very different because on the left side, this is what I lived and breathed for many, many years prior to Encorda. And it was a long, arduous process. It was going through months and months of work, doing lots of these stages and steps. And the worst bit about it is that last box. Insights lead to more business questions. And anytime that happened, right? And one time someone looked at it and went, oh, that's interesting. I think now we need to look into this and this would be the problem. That would be, okay, back to staging, get pull this data in, go through all of these steps to be able to turn it around. And this is not uncommon. Customers prior to Encorda would tell us of horror stories of a single column being added to reports taking 12 to 16 weeks. That That's not uncommon. And it's very, very difficult because just adding an additional column could be from a different table you have to rebuild a whole bunch of stuff to make that work. And it can be testing, making sure you don't break, validating numbers because you're going through so much transformation logic. And it's really hard to even validate it. On the encoder side, you can see the, those new questions. You don't need to go and do something again. It literally is just go to your business schema. If you asked me for a new column that I hadn't given to you, I have it in my, in my, my raw schema, which was the duplication of that application. Uh, let's say in this case, supply chain. And I just grab that column for where it is and drag and drop it in and say, that's available, start using it. That's it. Like it's literally no work to do that. You can just iterate. And that's why we've heard stories of people being able to do this in meetings where people have come in, like a CFO has come in and asked a question. And instead of expecting to have to wait a few weeks to get the answer, having the answer within five minutes in that same meeting, it changes the way people behave and it changes the way people address and approach doing their jobs, which for me, that I think is the really exciting bit. It's how do we make analytics not be a scorecard of how did you do, but how do we make analytics help you make better informed decisions in the moment so that those, those scorecards will naturally get better, not just have them lauded over you as like, how are you doing? Do better, right? We want people to be informed, to have, be able to have the analytics at their fingertips at the time so they can make the right decisions to affect those outcomes, which we all care about in the long run. And so now uh, that's kind of a overview of the Encoder platform. I'm gonna hand it back now to Mazen to kind of share a little bit about on what he was able to build and do using the platform and addressing that initial problem set that he spoke of and uh, outlined at the beginning. So back to you, Mazen. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. And I do wanna point out, it's really uh, impressive how Encoder handles the large volumes of data, but also the, the fast uh, 
uh, enhancement cycles where you can enhance much faster than before. And one thing I want to point out is that the demo that I'm going to show you now is based on the Encorda built-in visualization capabilities. But as Matthew mentioned, you can integrate this solution into your existing tools such as Tableau, Power BI, and others. So before diving into the demo, I want to share with you this slide that highlights the key KPIs or the metrics that you're going to be seeing on the dashboard. And these are kind of broken down into um, the, the backward view, which is kind of flipping back in your rear view emitter, previous periods, what you have in your current state, but also how do you project into the future. And they're broken down into the demand side of things, but also the supply, inventory purchasing, and production. So looking backwards, historically, you will get your, uh, what, what, what your fill rates were looking like over the last uh, period. So that you're going to see last 12 months uh, in the dashboards, how much you've been on time on that. And from the supply side, you're going to see the typ typical uh, KPI of inventory returns, uh, days inventory outstanding uh, from the purchasing side, um, how late you've been in the past on receiving those POs, and late production percentages. Uh, from a current state perspective, you're going to get uh, the backlog. That's your current fulfillment backlog. Uh, if you have a sales forecast, you're going to see the sales forecast. Um, you're going to get your on-hand <clears throat> inventory and values, your, how much you have open, currently open in terms of purchasing, uh, how much of that is late, and also the production backlog, and how much of that is already past due. Now, that's all good, but that's all telling you where you are today. Uh, so you're going to see on the dashboard, we take it to the next level with those projections here on the right side. You're going to look at, uh, from a demand perspective, what is the projected fill rate? How much are you going to be able to fulfill on time? And do you have the required inventory to do that? So that's why we look at the projected days on hand and the available balances at different, at different time intervals in, in the future. And we're going to be able to do that in two different ways. First, based on actuals, so that's based on actual bookings, but also we are able to pull in the forecast so we can uh, include forecast. Maybe you have value chain planning, ASCP, or other systems where you do your sales forecasting. So we're able to pull that in and um, consume the forecast with the actuals and do the projection based on both actual and forecast together. So that's that's kind of the exciting part here. The the future state is what uh, you'll be interested, I think, to take a look at. So with that, I'm gonna <clears throat> switch over to my browser and uh, go through the live dashboard here. So this is the landing page of the um, Incorta dashboard, and it's kind of uh, giving us very summarized high-level KPIs on the. KPI page on the left side, we have the typical uh, KPI of inventory turns, um, how it's been uh, over the last 12 months. So you'll see the LTM uh, component here, so we can compare how we are today versus the last 12 months, or how we do we project to be compared to the last 12 months. So I have our day, daily days inventory outstanding, the DIO here. And from an inventory perspective, we have the on hand value. From purchasing, we have how much we have in open purchasing, what is the current production backlog, how much of that is past due. So currently it's telling me that 32% 30, of my uh, production backlog is already late. And how does that compare to my, to my performance in the past over the last 12 months? So we can see we've been trending 13% late uh, compared to how we are, uh, are today 32% late. And from a demand perspective, demand side of things, we have the fulfillment backlog. So these are the sales orders coming in. What do we have currently open? Uh, how much of that uh, is currently late? And what's the average days late of open orders? And so on the right side is where it will be very interesting to see that projected fill rate metric. So we're looking at 80% here. That means we're not able to fulfill all the demand that we project. That means there's uh, there's a lot of action that we can take here to improve this number, the projected fill rate. And what is the on-time fill rate historically that we had? So we can compare what we're projecting versus how we've been trending over the last 12 months. So all these are very summarized KPIs, but they're drillable to the details. So we can, for example, go from the 
on hand inventory value to details about our inventory. So in this case, we're looking at the uh, breakdown by organization down to the item level, uh, the sub inventory, the item locator. So that would be the, the number that I drill down on from the KPI. <clears throat> so now if I switch over to the summary view, that's where we can start seeing more, more details about my current and future states. And this graph on the top left is going to tell me where, where I need to focus my attention. So it's going to give me a breakdown by item for the projected days on hand, which are represented by the bars here. But it also gives me an idea about my projected fill rate, because looking at the days on hand alone may not be sufficient to focus my attention. The priority is kind of driven by, by the demand at risk. That's why we have the projected fill rate as well in here, so we can look at uh, those items with the lower projected fill rates. <clears throat> so this visual here is going to focus my attention on what is important, and it's going to allow me to go from here to more details on the other pages, as you're going to see. So we can look at, okay, what, um, what customers are at risk, uh, what demand is at risk, and what uh, purchase orders do we expect to come in to address those issues? Do we, do we reschedule those purchases? Do we increase the volume on them? Do we address anything in our uh, production uh, uh, work orders? So all that can be driven from this visual up here. Now, to the, to the right of that, we have a horizontal projection. So this is a weekly trend of what we're seeing here is the projected available balance. So this gray area is my inventory balance over time. And I do have on the same visual, the different components that make up the projected balance. So we have the, the sales orders, we do have the purchasing, and if you do have production, you would have your WIP jobs, the work in process jobs, also on the same graph. And so this line graph or the, the projection is very much correlated with the table down here, which is uh, broken by organization and item. So the organization could be, for example, a warehouse, it could be a manufacturing plant or distribution center, and it's down to the item or SKU level. And in this case, it's a weekly projection. So we're at week 12 of the year, and it's telling me what my projected balance is going to be for each item. And I can quickly identify here certain areas of concern, for example, for item SB32. Uh, 982, we can see there's a problem expecting, expected starting um, week 13. That's in a red or a negative projected balance. But it's also telling me that this problem will go away uh, towards the beginning of April. So all the, all the uh, replenishments are going to be in time to address that issue after that. But this item here, for example, telling me it's going to be okay for the next couple of weeks, but we're going to be facing a problem right after that. And it's also telling me that <clears throat> at, at this time, there's no solution to that problem. It stays in red uh, all along into April and beyond. So if I select this um, item up here, you can see that the dashboard is going to filter down to the individual item number I've selected. And we can see the graph here is showing me my um, projected available balance, the gray area, and all the different replenishment orders coming in, but it also has the sales orders that are already booked that will decrease my balance. So we can see all that together on the same graph. Okay, so going back to the main screen here, and we have down below here the, the projected days on hand, and when, when does it run out of stock. So I have the dates of each item of when that item is expected to run out of stock and what is the projected fill rate. Uh, so I can focus my attention on those with the lower uh, fill rates. <clears throat> but as I said, the fill rate by itself may not be a good uh, indicator of what the urgency is without looking at the, the, the dollar value or the currency amount associated with that item. That's why we have this view on the right side that gives us the um, the current on-hand value for that item, 
and also the, the sales backlog amount, how much revenue is at risk. Uh, so we can focus our attention on the items that are more, more mostly contributing to our projected revenue. <clears throat> also on the main page, we do have a view of uh, scheduled uh, work orders. So if you are in manufacturing, you would able, able to see the, the, uh, the production backlog and how much of that is already past due. In this case, we see that there's 71% uh, past due backlog. That means there's, there's a lot that can be done. We can drill down from here to the individual work orders uh, to see more information about the scheduled jobs um, and when, when they're there, they would have been expected to, to complete uh, and more information about the components and resources tied to these work orders. <clears throat> so in this case, let me drill down to this item here and see it's telling me there's 79% projected fill rate and the days on hand is projected at five. I'm gonna drill down to the projected available balance detail page. And what it shows me here first is a kind of a daily projection for that item now. So now we're going from weekly to daily and it's gonna show me a waterfall of all the different activities that are projected to happen uh, over the next uh, periods. So we can see the a big purchase order coming in here that will increase my balance. Uh, maybe there's work orders scheduled, and then the red lines are going to be the the demand that is um, expected to happen or the promise to happen on the on these dates, which would bring down my inventory as we see here to three nine eight. <clears throat> okay, so this is the horizontal view I've been talking about, where we consolidate all the different data sets to get uh, to the projected balance. And if we look at the pivot table down here, this is the daily projection. And it's gonna give me all the different components that constitute my projected available balance. So it, it constitutes of the, um, what you currently have on hand, how much sales orders are open, um, the, the purchase order quantities, if there's work orders scheduled, and then that would be your projected available balance here, trended uh, over time. <clears throat> but it's also going to show me here the projected days on hand uh, for each of those days and also the projected fill rate. So for example, for the 17th and the 18th, we have 100% fill rate, so we're okay there. But I can see there's a problem on the 20th of March with an 84% um, projected fill rate. Now, I see there's a, an order coming here or a promised order for 34,000. I can drill down on this order. <clears throat> and it's going to give me uh, the customer information. So this is the demand at risk, basically telling me that this customer may not receive all their products on time, uh, when were they promised to receive it, the individual order number, and also, more importantly, the, the, uh, the currency amount or the dollar value in this case for that order. Okay, if I go, go back to my, <clears throat> my projection here, I can see that this is in red here for those days. That means it's going to be negative for a while, but then we can see it, it turns positive here on uh, on the 3rd of April. So it's going to be okay after that. And it's going to tell me that, okay, you've got some work uh, orders scheduled here. Maybe you have purchases scheduled and you can now uh, make a better decision of either rescheduling those or increasing the volume on these so you can perhaps shorten down this uh, duration of time where it's in red to, to, to avoid any, um, any customer uh, shortages. So if we look at one of those, for example, if we look into April, how things are trending, and I see I would have a balance of 4,130. Um, if I drill down to the transaction detail now, <clears throat> it's gonna give me as of that date that I drilled on, which is April 4th. How do things stand on that date? Uh, this waterfall is going to give me the all the different activities that are expected by that date. So what's on hand? How much uh, am I expected to receive? What is the um, the demand um, cumulative demand by that time, which is 113,000, and uh, what would be the uh, total projected uh, balance by that time? 
And we have all the different supporting details here. Again, we talked about um, showing the aggregated uh, KPIs, but also being able to get all the supporting details. So we're going down to the um, sales orders, the order numbers, when they're promised the customer, uh, all that is available um, as we drill through. And we also, from the, the, from the supply side, we have the work orders scheduled, uh, when they're scheduled to complete the remaining quantities and the purchase orders uh, by supplier, uh, by site, and when the promised receipt date would be with the PO numbers. And so we can drill even further from here. For example, if we have a work order uh, that we may wanna uh, try to address by rescheduling or increasing the volume on, uh, we can drill down on a work order <clears throat> and that will take us to uh, a view with all the different components for that assembly. Uh, so I drilled on a work order with that assembly or part number. It's gonna show me the raw materials, um, how much of each of the raw materials are required for that assembly and how many uh, how much units have been issued already. So we can even pinpoint what a component or raw material is gonna be the, the bottleneck for my operation. In addition to the components, we can also get to all the different uh, levels of the bill of material uh, by exploding the bill of material to the different components and get also the operation resources that are required for that production operation. So whether it's uh, labor or equipment, we're able to see here what is the, um, the usage rate or amount for that resource for that um, component within the assembly. So this is an example of where you can keep drilling down to, to the supporting details uh, for that work order. And you can similarly do the same with, with sales orders and purchase orders. All right, so this is an example of one item where we have uh, demand based on sales orders. Uh, but if you notice here, I don't have a forecast yet for this item. So I'm gonna show you another scenario where we have sales forecast and see how that would be different. <clears throat> so going back to my main dashboard and <clears throat> we're gonna look at another item, which is down here, the SB34. And this is, as I said earlier, it's gonna be negative and there's no action so far to, to correct that. <clears throat> so I'm gonna go down to the projected balance detail page. And like before, we do have this daily basis projection uh, on the left and on the right, we're gonna see the cumulative projection uh, projected balance. <clears throat> so we did look at the gray line earlier, which is the projected available balance based on the actual bookings. But now we're able to overlay the sales forecast on here. This is the daily sales forecast. In this case, it's defined on a daily basis, daily rate. And we're gonna overlay the orange line, which is the uh, projected balance based on the forecast. And we can compare now the actual projection versus the forecasted projection and see it's more dramatic in terms of decreasing my inventory because there's a, there's a sales forecast incorporated in my projection. <clears throat> so if we scroll down here, you're gonna have two separate scenarios or two different views of the projection. There's gonna be the top one, which is based on actual bookings. Uh, the one below is including the, the demand forecast. And so the components of the projected balance here for the forecast <clears throat> is gonna include the original sales forecast. It's gonna include the sales quantities. So these are the actual orders. And then it's gonna have, it's gonna do a consumption of that forecast to deduct any uh, sales orders. And it's gonna make sure that if there's any big orders that go above the forecast, then the, of course, the sales order is gonna take precedence. So this is the cumulative demand forecast uh, projected. And if we compare this view to the view above based on actuals, for example, if we look at uh, the 24th of March, you know, it shows me it's okay with the actual projection where we have 340 units on hand and the projected days on hand, as of that date, it's gonna be six. But with this forecast down below on the 24th, 
it's going to be um, negative 10. So I have an issue there on that day, and it's showing me zero days on hand for that day. Um, so it's more um, dramatic when we look at things with the sales forecast, and we can see it goes negative here uh, after the uh, end of March. And so I can drill down here on <clears throat> any of those days. Let's go on the April 2nd. This 520 is the projected available balance. And so my waterfall now on the right, which is the forecasted one, is different than the actual one on the left. You see the sales um, unfulfilled order quantity is um, 1.35 thousand based on actuals, but based on forecast, it is much higher. It's 1.71 thousand. Uh, because of the, the forecast being incorporated in my demand projection. And so down be, below, in, in addition to the sales orders, we also have this demand forecast being represented. In this case, it is a forecast based on a daily rate, uh, and that is the 1,710 uh, cumulative forecast that is projected as of that date. All right, so that's pretty much the what, what the dashboard is going to cover is going to give you a view of both actual and forecasted scenarios with the drill down capabilities. All right, so with that, I'm just going to recap a few key takeaways of what you've seen today. Um, so the solution, the dashboard you've seen, it is uh, specifically built for eBusiness Suite. Um, so if you're using eBusiness Suite for supply chain, this dashboard would kind of give you a very quick start uh, on doing the supply chain uh, projection performance. And it is, as you've seen, built up on the Incorta direct data mapping technology. It's going to be uh, able to handle and scale, uh, handle the performance um, at scale. So it's not performance is not something it's, that came to us as an afterthought. We had it in the very initial uh, phases of designing the solution. Um, and you're going to see that the solution is going to give you uh, much enhanced reliability, sales reliability with projecting the fill rates on your demand and keeping an eye on the projected um, days on hand and projected balances. You're, you're able to see also the comparison of uh, what your projected performance is as it compares to the last 12 months. We, we see that on the KPI page. Um, and this solution is going to offer you the automation scalability that will reduce the reliance on IT for any ongoing operations. The business is going to be able to kind of self-serve their needs to get the data uh, that they need, uh, not just at high level, but at the, the lower level details as well to support their uh, both short-term and long-term supply chain uh, processes. Um, 